students, uh, the colloquium becomes their first class in the department. <laughs> so I guess we have some cases that are new. Um, so welcome to the weekly colloquium of the School of Astrophysics. For the last uh, four weeks, we were having multidisciplinary topics uh, on universities in the 21st century. So we are back to astrophysics this week. Um, so we have uh, Dr. Dhrubhajyoti Shengupto, uh, who is our uh, alumnus. Uh, Dhrubhajyoti did his MSc from 2016 to 2018. And then uh, he went to the University of Bologna in Italy to do his PhD. Bologna, as you know, it has been discussed in the university talks as well because it is the oldest uh, continuously running uh, institution of higher education in the world. So you can say this is the oldest. In other words, it's the oldest university. Uh, if Nalanda continued to run without any gap, then it would be the oldest university, but unfortunately it didn't. Um, so Dhruvajati, after finishing his PhD, uh, was offered a postdoctoral position at NASA Goddard and an affiliation at University of Maryland and Baltimore County. And he is a postdoc there, but he hasn't joined in person yet because of uh, uh, visa issues. Uh, so he is, uh, that's, that's, the, the bright, every every cloud has a bright side. So the bright side of that is that Rubhajati is now here to talk about his work. Um, and so Rubhajati will talk about uh, its revision on local opportunity region. And uh, I'm glad that uh, for some of the new faces, the first colloquium is by a recent alumnus of the department. So you can see that how you can easily progress from that side of the room to this side. Uh, in two years. <laughs> in two years. So without much delay, let's hear from the Thank you. 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 Thank I mean, we record the talk in English. No, but he wants to attend. So, let's see. Oh, I think uh, he should be able to hear us. Tathagato, are you there? I'm writing the chat if you can't hear us. He's muted. So... Okay, let's let's not worry. We will. If there is a problem, we will see. Okay. So, uh, hello everyone. It's it's great to be in this side of uh, the colloquium. Uh, it's a very different experience, uh, but I'm glad that I got this opportunity. Uh, uh, so let's go a bit about the title of the talk. Why I said X-ray vision on local oxygen region. One of the reason I said it's X-ray vision is uh, most of my talk would be on X-ray observations on X-ray spectral analysis, but also X-ray vision we tends to say to two things where we want to observe uh, certain things through like we want to see uh, what is happening through something and what is happening deep inside. So uh, what this AGN or active galactic nuclei, especially uh, it is uh, covered by this uh, thick molecular dust and gas, which we call torus. And uh, a significant portion of a significant uh, population of these active galaxies are obscure. So, this reason why also I want to focus on local. Local means we want we are focusing on the active galaxy that is within 200 megaparsec from our galaxy. So that is redshift 0 0.05, less than 0 0.05. So let's talk a bit about uh, 
what I will focus in the beginning, I'll say why we need to study obscured AGN, and then I'll uh, briefly touch the topic of the AGN properties and the spectral components. And then of the torus, which is the, at least in the local universe, the most prominent uh, structure which uh, blocks the AGN or the active galactic nuclei, and the, at least the central engine. And uh, later I will discuss more on the topics of how we updated the sensors of, act of obscured active galaxies uh, and also about compound thick AGN in the next slides. And before ending, I will also touch a bit how multi wavelength analysis can give us a better uh, characterization and a comprehensive analysis of something that is obscured in certain wave bands. So let's uh, see, this is a very trivial picture, which many people might know uh, is uh, at the center, this is an active galaxy. And every at the center of every galaxy, there is a supermassive black hole. So it's also same here. But it, it's also surrounded by uh, accretion disk, which is covered by this uh, thick uh, molecular dust, which we call torus. Now, there are various classifications of uh, active galaxies, depending on the unification model, and also there are other classifications. But what I want to say is there, in, in my talk, we'll focus on non-jetted AGN. So there are also AGNs which has jet, in my talk, in my research, I will talk on the AGNs where there is no jet. And it is observed from the age on angle, that is from this. So uh, it is mostly blocked, the AGNs that, that, that are blocked from the, age, uh, from the age on side, that is around 90 degrees. These agents are generally called C for two galaxies. So let's see why we need to study obscured agents. Uh, the thing is, uh, around 1960s, in, in the beginning of 1960s, there, there have been a, a, a starting of the campaign of X-ray observations. And uh, when these X-rays were observed in the 50s and 60s, uh, we found that there is a cosmic X-ray background uh, radiation, which might sound very similar to cosmic microwave background radiation, but interestingly, cosmic X-ray background was before. <laughs> cosmic, uh, I mean, this concept and this idea actually developed before, few years before, probably three, four years before, uh, the CMB. But uh, it was not very well understood that why, that what is the origin of the CXB? It was mostly uh, people thought that it, it's coming from the extra galactic sources and which was, which came to be eventually right. And since our last 60 years of observations, we have found that the in the energy scale that this is the CXB uh, observation. And we see that there is a sharp peak around 20 to 30 keV, kilo electron volt in the peak. And we found through a lot of uh, extra ob observations that obscured AGN, actually, the one that is covered, it's seen from the agent side, contributes around 40% uh, of the CXB at its peak. And a type of obscured AGN, which is classified as Compton thick AGN, that is, if the obscuring column density is above 10 to the power 24 per centimeter square, then we classify it as Compton thick AGN or CT AGN, which I will uh, continue to call it from the next slides. That contributes around 15 to 20% at the peak. And in much more local universe, we'll see that that is redshift less than 0 0.1, the observed CTAGN fraction is between 5 to 10%. Whereas the C CXB population synthesis models, that is the models they prepared to uh, calibrate how much population of AGN and obscured AGN should exist to create this kind of plot. It's estimated that the CTAGN fraction should be from 20 to 50%. So there is a significant gap between the observed fraction and the uh, the fraction that we find from the model. And to fill the gap, basically, we come in. Yeah. So, yeah. The thing that 40% is contributed by obscure AGN. It's the missing 45% in order to be by the observed AGN, AGN contribution. Uh, I mean, the observed means, I mean, you're saying about this 40%, right? Yes, yes this at the peak is, uh, it's around all the redshifts. 
How do you get it? Is obscure region mm. those you don't see them? Yeah. Yes, it's mostly because the high energies like X-rays they come through. So from whatever is coming through from the high energies, because we cannot detect the optical energy. We are we can mostly detect the X-rays and something much more high. So from that, we try to uh, understand what is the spectra, and then we classify it as an obscured or an un unobscured. If we can see the broad line regions, the optical UV, then it's not an obscured region. But so you mean to say that uh, the CFD hmm. has been well explained by all the observed aging? The whatever the, fraction difference. Uh, it's, it's very uh, tricky to say it's well explained, but from the observations we have till now, we can say that the significant part comes from AGM. And those significant, from the significant part is coming, we see is coming from, at least from obscure AGM near the peak that I'm saying, which is around 20 to 30. So this is 40% of the total uh, population and uh, not just the 40% of the AGMs. Uh, no, uh, 40 40 percent of the yes. total population Asian. Yes. So Asian. Yes. So 40. But see, CFD has to have some limiting Z, no? because beyond that Z. Yeah, but you can't see. There's dimming. There will be dimming. Yes. Dimmy. yes. 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 The axis is modeled. Uh, yeah, yeah. These models are more or less stayed in the extra luminosity function functions on the basis of which they calculate the CFD. So. Uh, so this is a very interesting thing where there is a gap between our observations and predictions. So what is happening? Where are the missing agents and all? So uh, and also the reason that we can we also tends to study obscure region is uh, it carry information of the galaxy 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 evolution and also galaxy merger paradigm and also the orientation of the torus. So uh, giving an idea of the AGN unification model, the validity also of the AGN unification model. So it's a very interesting thing to study in general. And this is how we, it's a very good representation of an AGN, where at the center, there is a supermassive black hole surrounded by the accretion disk. And there is this uh, broad line clouds, and then there is torus and the polar dust and narrow line clouds and everything. And here we see, the ACD, the, that is the spectral energy distribution of unobscured agent. So what my talk will be focused on is the, uh, the multicolored black body that is getting emitted from the accretion disk, which is around this optical uh, UV peak, and from the hot plasma, which we uh, classify as corona, from there, this, uh, the, uh, the X-ray line. So, uh, we more or less sort of know, I'm not going very much deep into how the UV is getting created. It's a, uh, it's a disk where the, in the every annular region has different temperature and then it emits a series of black bodies which we uh, eventually add and form this multicolored black body. But for the corona, let's see how the X-rays are cooked within AGM. So this is also a very good representation, don't take it by heart. So this is a black body at the center, and there is an accretion disk. And corona is somewhere here, not exactly here, but somewhere in the above, in the near accretion disk. So this thermal component, that is the UV and optical radiation, is comes out, and a part of it is interacting with the corona. And after the interaction, it goes through a series of inverse component scattering. And this inverse component scattering gives a power law of the photons, which is around uh, 1.8, 2.2, the spectral index. And it comes out, and this photon actually upscatters and comes out as a as the X-ray photons, which we, uh, come, which we see here. And it comes out isotropically in all the direction. So you can say around half of it comes out of the accretion disk, and the remaining half again sends back. And the one that sends back interacts somewhere inside the accretion disk or somewhere out, the, somewhere in the accretion disk or in the outer part of the accretion disk where the torus star. And then it also uh, goes through another process of photoelectric absorption and reflection. And the higher the density, we see that this, uh, it comes out with uh, around 20 to 30 kV a constant hump that we say in, in, in this band. 
So just try to connect that this hump is around 20 to 30 kV that we see, and also the CXB, it also has a peak around 20 to 30 kV. So this is also gives a, at least in a trivial, at least in a particular way that there is a correlation between the obscure region and the CXB peak that we see. And along with that, we also see this uh, strong fluorescent lines like iron K alpha and K beta. This thing we can talk a lot more, but this is more theoretical, so I'm going more on the results. So this is how generally we uh, we can see if there is a extremely obscured and gas density and densely gas in the reflection component. We see a spectral hump in the around above 10 kV at least, around 20 to 30 kV. But that's very different from the water band. 20 to 30. And that depends, uh, 20 to 30 depends on um, uh, on the so photoelectric absorption. More than 30 or below 20? Yeah, I mean, it can be. I mean, the hump is there, but there it's, a it's, a, it's, it's a spread. It. So, I mean, it depends on the, uh, on the scattering, photoelectric scattering and the obscuration. Okay, so, so we have the material 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 uh, ionized and and density of the aqueous. Yes, yes. The density is the most important part. That how strong the hump is. Yeah. Not strong, but the, I'm interested in the position of the hump. The position. Oh yes. So it it, it can it can also. Have a, a EDL, a, not EDL. Yeah. The EXB. Yeah. Hump around twenty. That is the observed. Yes, yes, yes. And. With some parameter, you see a hum yes. in the model around that. Thing. Why I'm saying is because at low red shift, this is around 20 to 30. If you go at high red shift, the hum also shifts in the lower part. So uh, that we, because it's, it's red it's shift. Uh, oh, it's just the red shift. The red shift. So, yes. CXB. CXB, yes. Yes, but, the, but the CXB is, I yeah, mean, yeah. these things we, it's uh, already calibrated on the basis of the reference. See, see, I mean, naively, I would say that what else can uh, can cause, uh, you know, yes, what else can cause it's, the CXB other than the region? I mean, I cannot exactly. think of anything else. That is the most powerful extra source in the universe. Yeah, that's so. right. Uh, so... Uh, so this is how the picture is. Now, apart from that, we also have to keep in mind that this UV and X-ray radiation, it comes out, but it interacts with this gas in the torus and the polar dust. It absorbs and re-emits in the infrared. So it's a, it's a range of infrared, which you see uh, in, in here. And this uh, infrared emission comes from these obscuring materials, which I said torus and the polar dust, which contains dust grains and gas, but dust is responsible for the extinction in UV to infrared, and gas as the absorption by the X-rays, especially the metals, they are absorbed, uh, they absorb the X-rays. Now, uh, on this obscuration picture, we classify the, there are two types of obscuration, that is Compton thin obscuration or Compton thick, depending on the line of sight of the column density, that, that is what, what we see. So if the, the column density is around 22 to 24, we classify it as Compton thin. If it is above 24, we classify it as Compton thick. So let's, my focus for the next few slides would be Compton thick. So let's remember this information. There's the line of sight column density above 24 is Compton thick AGN. These two names, Compton thin and thick, will come all over my talk. <laughs> Uh, so, this is uh, how the ACD actually changes on the basis of this, uh, the different gas density and obscuration. So, as you see that the column density is around 10 to the power 22, which is in Compton thin regime. Uh, it is mostly dominated by a power law that is you see that I said that is the transmitted power law, that 1.8 to 2.0 that uh, power law. And the reflection component is very weak. But as the uh, column density started to get increased, if we see 24, 25, keeping all the parameters same, we see that there is a dominance of the reflection component at least above 10 kV. And below 10 kV, it is totally suppressed. The, the power law is totally suppressed. So whatever we see is mostly, mostly thermal emission. So these are some strong signatures to identify that it is a Compton thick AGN or not. That is, we see a reflection harm, some strong emission lines, 
the suppression of the transmitted power law and also the equivalent width of this line is generally above 1 kV for Compton TKG. So just keep this thing in mind. I will also continue to repeat, but so this is... The restriction from the y-axis, is there? Or... Hmm? Yeah, I don't see the hum. Here? Yes. Yes, I mean, it's uh, it's basically uh, the hum and also the transmitted power law. I mean, they are merging together. That's why it's not like harm falling down, but it's uh, the harm and the power works together. The final ACB is not a harm. No, no, no. There ACB will be a harm, but it's there will the be a harm that is not like falling down. Yes, exactly. The transmitted power and the harm. So when it falls down, the transmitted power law is is the dominant. But there is a harm in the beginning. That is, ACB is not the harm. It's just the model that we are proposing, which is creating the harm. So, uh, so the type of torus that is responsible for this kind of obscuration till now we have classified as uniform torus or clumpy torus. And by the name, it is very clear what is a uniform torus. It's a uniform gas distribution. Clumpy torus has different clumps of gas at different radii. And how we classify in modeling is we see the line of sight column density and we use some of the torus models that I will say in the next slides. And we calculate the average torus column density. If we see that the line of sight column density and the average column density are comparable to each other, we say it's a uniform uh, torus, we classify it. If we see that there is a big difference, then we classify it as a, a clumpy torus. So these are the very two famous uniform torus models. And this one is the first uniform torus models, which are the donut shape, uh, which you might also see in many textbooks. They use this uh, torus. And uh, this is a bonus, which is much more newer. And it is it has a spherical distribution of gas with biconical carbon. So uh, in my torus, they have three configurations. Why, why is it my torus? I mean, this it's is a, a Martin, even Y. And this is, this is very strange that, uh, that, that, that there's a coincidence that the names are torus and horus. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I heard from Balakovic. I think Tathagato can give because Tathagato was telling me something how Balakovic gave his name of Boris. He just named he just named B A in a book T and gave it like. <laughs> but, uh, but about my torus, uh, they have three uh, configurations. That is direct component. That is the component coming directly <laughs> from the corona. So it's not interacting with. Uh, so it is interacting but not getting reflected. It's might getting absorbed, but not getting reflected. Uh, and then there is a scattered component, that is the component hitting the inner side of the accretion disk or torus, and then coming to the observer. And then there is a line component, which is the fluorescent line generating somewhere inside. So we use a decoupled configuration of the my torus, that is we decouple this direct scattered and line component and try to see what is the column density of the region that is interacting with the direct component and with the reflected component and check what is the density difference. So on the basis of that, we calculate the clumpiness. If there is a huge density difference, then we say it's a clumpy. If not, we say it's a uniform problem. Boros has an advanced move is this inclination angle and covering factor. These are free parameter in Boros, but in my torus, no. So what this free parameter in Boros does is it gives much more flexibility to fit the extra space. As you see, as the covering factor increases, covering factor means how much the uh, torus is bigger, so it covers the incoming radiation. The, the upper hump is much more better constrained. And also you see with the inclination angle, the lower part is better constrained. So it's giving a better idea how the spectra is uh, modeled, depending on how much data we have. So Boros in general is much more advanced. But still, people use my torus because it's the olden one, oldest one. So they use both most of the cases. So, but so what, hmm? yeah, so, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, what you say, I mean, uh, when you are fitting this X ray spectrum, let's yeah. say with any of these torus models, mm -hmm. I mean, typically, how, so let's say my torus, how many free parameters are there? Oh, there are uh, uh, some, there are parameters like uh, the equatorial column density, it calculates the equatorial column density, the line of sight <laughs> column density. Then there are some normalization on the basis of how much is the flux. 
So like this kind of information. It's about so, what? Three, four, five? Five, six. Five, six. And this one is like two seven. more. Uh, so only two more. Okay. Two more. It has just the flexibility of the inclination angles. So you can also calculate this. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, yes. Hmm. Uh, in fact, I understand you are making it uh, clumpy, so that is the new thing. No, it is that. uniform, so it's uh, uniformly, it's not clumps. It's That's in my torus. No, my torus is not clump. Both are uniform torus models. Then the powering uniform factor cap. means what? Powering factor means that this thing, you see, it's much more forward. So this biconical is much more guarded. But that is a mitorus. How big is that? No, no, it's not changing. Mitorus, it's the same size. And this is not getting bigger or smaller or anything. It's the same size. Why can't No, that's how the model is made. I don't know. But the size is, to me, it's just a parameter. Yeah, I know. But I mean, this these are how the 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 model fit file are made on the basis of some NCMC calculations. And we just use, we don't make the models. We use how the model is made and on the basis of how much free parameter they have provide, provided. That's why we use Boros a bit more uh, flexibly because we can tune some parameters in, Bo in my Torus. So it's not a model, it's the code. Yeah, I think yes, it's yes, a code. Yes, it's a code. It's when I'm saying model, it's so when I'm saying model is basically I'm trying to say the code. Oh. Is the, yes. So the physical yeah. model is same That's except it. that you have two more parameters you can tune. Yeah, you can tune. Well, and, I, I, yes. Well, I think I was saying saying that the physical model may not be same. Yeah, that's what I mean. No, no, yes, yes. No, I, I don't think it's a simple change of See, yeah. the direct scattered and line components are tied together, which means that if you increase the torus size, fraction of obscuration will increase and so like, so there are more to, I mean, yeah, in the that's sense what that I'm it's, saying. Not, it's not, it's not just, just adding to extra parameters. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, have more changes in the thing. Just, just changing. Even the, the modeling has to so, be changed. True, true. I mean, it also depends no, on the no, geometrical I shape. Change the model of the torus. That's not your change. Well, I mean, if you change, I mean, the, the, the geometry is changing. So in that sense, the model. So it, if I increase uh, the height of the torus, that's not changing my model. So, the so, so actual so only by as 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 Vitovan said that let's say direct scatter and line components are tied together. Can we have that condition if we want to change the inclination angle in the torus? Is it fix some of the based on you know how there are free parameters which they have to free sure. for certain observations. So they did that. So now if you change the size then you have to re, re we have to change the other free parameters. So that's that's probably so the basic model of torus that is not being changed. That's my understanding. Yeah, yeah. I mean, model. I mean, it, I mean would you call a black body and a multicolor black body two different models or just the same? It's no. two different models. It's two different models. Multicolor black body is a two different models. So that's okay. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. In that, in, in that way, right. I agree. <laughs> So uh, yes, so this is the, the the flexibility of the borus, and for clumpy torus, here the geometry is also a bit different. So the clumpy models actually uh, came uh, in much more is very recently, and uh, the clumpy model says that the reflection component that I was saying is coming from the inner part of the torus or from the accretion disk. There is a thick a ring, compact thick ring of, uh, of gas clumps near the equatorial region that is responsible for the reflection component for extremely high compton thick aging. And the gas distribution are like a random uh, gas, uh, random molecules uh, present all over the vertical. So that's how they have uh, like created this model where uh, the they have covering fraction of the inner ring. So how much the inner ring is covering the center from something zero to something big. And also the cloud dispersion, which is either totally dispersed cloud or almost no dispersion. There is the two extreme ranges. So, so it is all the on the basis of the cloud dispersion and the covering factor of the inner ring. All the possible, uh, like the grids, it is shown. So if there is no inner ring, but there is only cloud dispersion, the torus would look like this. This is extreme. 
uh, if the there is the kind of uh, density 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 yes, yes. Uh, these are okay sorry yes these are density part of the test this is also the same but here in x clumpy they, they did it much more uh, simply compared to this one they said this, that it has a gaussian distribution at the center so center has more gas and as we go up the gaussian distribution actually like it goes to uh, it decreases and it has a radial component around the radius. Sorry, so Gaussian like, distribution of what? I mean, what is the... Of the gas clouds. So it's saying that the, along the equator, there yes. are more gas clouds. And that is like a Gaussian distribution. So oh, the, okay, along the equator. And the equator, and then it's spread out with the vertical. So these are the two clumpy torus models that is also getting used a lot. I have used it, uh, which I'll talk about a bit later. But uh, let's see. So, good question. For X clumpy, it's of the same size and uh, same kind of mass yeah, for this. For here, they have done a bit more complexities depending on what, how much far away the gas cloud is. Uh, so, Let's come to, uh, let's introduce to you to this group that I am a part of. This is a Clemson INAC CT agent group. Uh, you can check in the websites. We have lots of papers and also the things that we are working on. So the goal of our project, of the final goal of our group is to obtain a complete census or complete means almost complete, uh, heavily obscured AGN in the local universe, uh, observed in the energies one <coughs> Of the energy is 15 to 150 k. These are the people that you see. But let's remove this people. Yes, sir. He is Marco. That's, that's Marco. That's, Marco. So that's Marco. Garima's, uh, Garima's super. Advisor. Yes. Yes. Uh, he is my. He, he is my. Uh, he is Christian Vignali, my advisor, and Stefano Marco. And these are all the other members. Uh, so let's remove uh, this beautiful picture of us and see another beautiful picture of the sweet. Why we wanted to detect between 15 to 150 kV is because bat is sensitive to hard X-rays. So the X-ray that is coming through the torus, dense torus clouds, it can be detected from bat. And uh, we have used a volume limited sample with less than 0 0.05 uh, with the available bat observations, that is 100 month bat observations. And from that, uh, one of the projects that we are doing is uh, we have selected 55 CTAGN candidates uh, which have archival Neustar data. Why I'm saying candidates? Because all these agents uh, were, has been classified as a Compton thick obscured agent. Obscured for sure, but Compton thick. That is, it has a column density above 10 to the power 24 uh, when it is observed with black. What we did is we took the Neustar data and we uh, wanted to study uh, the spectral extra spectral analysis and also the mid infrared acid fitting. The mid infrared part I'm coming later, but the, for the extra spectral analysis, we used uh, on less than 10 kV. We used Chandra and XMM Newton, and we find that all of them have Chandra and XMM Newton data quite a few times at least. And we also have BAT and new star. Now BAT has a large collecting area. It has a high background. So it has much more low sensitivity for the faint sources okay. because these are very obscure sources. Whereas new star is a grazing incidence telescope, where it is a coded mask telescope. For new star, as it is a focusing telescope, it has a low background and has excellent sensitivity. So it gives better uh, estimation to the parameters like line of sight column density, power law, and all these other stuff. So for my research and our research, even though we have bad, we have only used new star and the hard X-ray. And for the soft, we have used uh, Chandra and XMM Newton. And for in particular, in my work, I have analyzed all these seven sources collected from BAT. And uh, I will show some of them, obviously not all. So this is one of the sources where it has Chandra observations. Uh, the red ones is soft X-ray and the blue one is hard X-ray. You will see in the plot also. So it has Chandra observations with very good spectral counts that is below 10 kV and also neutral observation above 10 kV. And I will just show, so let's do it like this. Uh, I have like, as we are discussing, we saw that 
if the transmitted power law is dominating over the uh, uh, Compton thing, the reflection hump, it's a Compton thin AGM. But if the Compton hump is dominating over the transmitted power law and there is a also signature of line, then it is a Compton thick AGM. So just keep in mind and try to say just visually what kind of AGM is this one. Do you see a, a hump or a transmitted power law? So it's just a power law. And we also, when we fit both the models, my torus and boros, we see that the line of sight column density, average column density, both comes below 10 to the power 22. So this is a Compton thin AGM. But we say it's come clumpy because the line of sight column density and average column density for both the models, we see within the error range, they are quite different. So it has a clumpy distribution. And we also see that the equivalent width of the uh, iron k alpha line is also less than 1 kV. So it's typical. Interesting to note that this source has been classified as a Compton thick AGM in uh, Ricci's uh, 2015 paper. Ricci's paper has overestimation of a lot of uh, Compton thick AGM that our group is trying to uh, resolve. The reason that they because they use the XRD and BAT. And with the low sensitivity, it was not very well modeled. And they also used a very old model also, not But they, it was such a big difference that they yes. did uh, overestimate like, the image. Yes, yes, it was like 20 to the power 25, but oh. we are counting 10 to the power 23. So it's almost two orders. If you have a clumpy system, why should be that iron oxide column density is less than other column density? Not always, it can also be better, or also be higher. So we have some sources where also there are line of set columns. Yes, I mean, the average column density is the average in all, they calculate on the basis of all the inclination angle. So it is a computational. The one you see is observed. Sorry, the one you see is observed. The one you see here is computational on the basis of the model. So it, it is possible that there are some column densities where at the line of sight column density, which is above the average. And that was what we saw. And we also expect to see that if the average, if there is average column density, there are some line of sight column density above that and also below that. So for this particular case, it, case it is below. What I mean to say is that, let's say I have a uh, uniform torus mm -hmm. that will have a column density. Mm -hmm. Now if I make it a clumpy, mm -hmm. each clump will have a Higher yeah, but not where to uh, yeah, right, right. But we are not doing that. We are using my torus and borus with their uniform torus model. We cannot make it clumpy. They are uniform. We are making it clumpy by decoupling two of the parameters. That is the reflection component and the line of sight component. So decoupling two parameters means one parameter that is coming directly to the eyes, another parameter that is getting reflected and coming to the eyes. And we are decoupling and trying to see that these two regions have similar kind of densities on them. That's how we are. We want to classify it as clumpy or not in the first order, I would say. In the second order, we will further go into using clumpy models and see how much more characterizations we can. But the observation has all of this, right? You are not resolving it. Directly on the result. No observation. Uh, I mean, when you are receiving the X ray emission, mm -hmm. that is essentially all line. I mean, there are various uh, some photons are coming be after being scattered by the torus. Mm -hmm. Some photons, if the bit is a clumpy mm -hmm. model, if the bit is a clumpy torus, mm -hmm. then some photons are coming without getting scattered, some photons are coming after getting scattered. Hmm. All of these are coming to you together. Hmm. So then, I think when you make, when you use that observation, hmm. you should get an average anyway. No, we, we get the photons in different energies. The one that scatters, the energy changes. The one which is coming <coughs> absorbed has a different energy. So you are saying that no, but you don't know that, right? I mean, no, from the spectra, we can get to know that. I mean, that's what we can see in this plot. No. But in the next, you will see that there are some photons which have a hump in there, and some have, doesn't have a hump. So our model, what so you if you look at soft and hard X-rays, you are seeing two different nature of the spectrum. 
or yes i mean two different nature means uh, i mean it's one similar nature where there is a dominance of the power law or the reflection function why i'm saying soft and hard is because for the better characterization of the model otherwise if we take only new stuff there is only the hard x-ray generally the soft part is not very well modeled so there is some there is the more uh, uncertainty okay so that and is when you are putting the average column density what is that what, what parameter you are getting from observation that is being used to calculate the average column density? the shape of the hump the shape of the hump because it's coming from the reflection pump and then it also uses the inclination angle so from the from this two it calculates the average okay so if we go to the next one this is another source which we had xmm newton and new star observation two new star observations so say this one whether it's a compton thin or compton thick it's clearly compton thick because there is a the dominance of the uh, reflection component and also very strong iron line and we also find the same that from the uh, torus at my torus and porus that both are coming above uh, uh, like 10 to the power 24 and also the average and the column uh, the line of set column density they are very much comparable to each other within the error range so we classify it as a smooth or uniform column density with compton thick edge here so we classify we are classifying it as a comparatively smoother distribution compared to the other uh, the previous one. <clears throat> so as you see that it's very by just looking at it you can understand that whether it's as a class it, it has a compton thick agent or compton thin agent at least for now let's see this one this is a uh, xmm newton and Neustra. this has also two newster observations and for this tell me whether it is a uh, just by looking, is it possible to say whether it has a power law dominance or a reflection component? I, I can see a bump. You can see a bump, but you can also see a dense of the power law. Yeah. So it has both. So that's where comes the necessity of use, using the models for the characterization. So here we see that for the bump, we can calculate, the model calculates the uh, average column density above the threshold, component thick threshold. But the line of sight column density we find it is around is less than the Compton thick threshold. So the line of sight column density is Compton thin, but the average is higher. So this is also clearly a clumpy, and initially we classified it as a partially Compton thin model. Very recently we have changed, we have changed this classification, but for the talk, let's not go in that detail. So this is how uh, the model helps in characterization. We can also see that the equivalent width is less than 1 kb. So it doesn't have any signature being a Compton thick AGN apart from the medium from where it got reflected. So, yes. Like, the model is my torus? Yes. Yeah. 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 So, then from my torus, you are getting an average or average density. Hmm. And from here, you are getting two things. How do I know which one is correct? No. If I can hit the mod, hit the data yeah. with my Taurus model. Yes, with this one. And similar kind of fitting. Hmm. Then I will say that's the model. Why no, I, no, I, I, don't, model. I don't see much difference between yes. the my Taurus and Boras exactly. fitting. They exactly. are pretty then consistent. Then why should I consider one model is better than other? Very good question. Two reasons. <laughs> one, my Taurus is very old. So it's much more accepted to the community. So if you, uh, it has happened quite a lot of times that when you use a new model, we also have to show that there is some consistency with the old model with some improvements. So in most of our cases, we have used both to keep it in that way. But this is also important. Again, that, yeah, yeah, that how much model dependence yes, is there. How much so model, to make yes. it model dependent. Exactly. In, it's not very much model dependent because the second point is uh, there are some cases which I have not showed here, but uh, if I I could have prepared for them, that where we see that my torus is failing to give a better constraint on the parameters, but Boras is, because it has a very fi it has fixed his uh, uh, inclination angle and the covering factor in certain value. So when it gets much higher or a bit lower, Boras has a better fitting compared to the my torus. Well, again, I will go for changing both parameters in my torus. 
but no. you cannot like you, you cannot no, change. No, 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 no. you are including a cloud to me that is you are changing the physical thing of the torus if i change height and density of the torus that's not my changing my morning okay yes but it depends on how much uh, it depends on the type of data you have I like know, you cannot... is, it, is, it, is it correct to think that in Boras you are just changing the height and density of the thing or you have more? No, 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 there are more, there are more, there to, are more, more to it. I mean, so the most I prominent... Mean, understand, the idea is that we have a data. Yes. You want to classify the AGN as Compton thick or Compton uh, thin. Yes. And we are using two kinds of uniform model here. I mean, this both are uniform models, yes. by torus and porous. Yes. And trying to see that if they give me consistent results in terms of the column density. And we yes. see that they are consistent. Yes, yes, yes. Is that, that is the right here. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so uh, this is, we can classify it as a Compton thin or partially Compton thick with clumping. So, Similarly, we have classified or we have classified all the 55 uh, candidates and we find that this is the line of sight uh, axis, uh, line of sight column density, this is the average column density. So this line is the Compton thick threshold. So in Rich's plot, all these points were above this. But when we use new star observations and XML Newton and Chandra, we see that around half of the population actually coming down below so uh, and it's coming it's coming actually Compton thin and we also found that the average column density and the line of sight column density so average column density threshold is this one so you see that this line is y equal to x line so you can say that when the line of sight column density and average column density are almost equal to each other so the points closer to each other means those points are have a smooth torus or uniform torus if it's far away it's a plumb and we find that around 80% of the torus ha have quite significant clump in nature. So they are not very uniform. And so this AGN with high clumpiness, because clouds don't stay at the same place, it moves. So this, this uh, AGN is are good candidates for further follow-up observations if there are some changes in the column density or flux. So that is something that we uh, were looking for. And we also, yes, go. Sorry. Go, go. Yes. Uh, so you are defining Compton thick as Compton thick. Yes. 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 Similar thing means uh, it's similar H E D difference. So why are you are picking the boundary mm -hmm. that Compton thick or Compton thin mm -hmm. that has been assuming it's a uniform torus that 10 to power 24 value. Yes. I mean if but, both are above then we are yes. No. No, I mean if if uh, if they are similar to each other, sorry, yes. I mean it's coming to the same axis. What is the question? No, if the geometry is different, mm -hmm. uh, if I have a clumpy torus yes. and a uniform torus, yes, to see me a quantum thick or thin, mm -hmm. that will not have the same density as the average density. No, if I can, I, can. can I think it's a little bit deeper understood. Mm -hmm. So I think. If it is Compton thick or not, mm -hmm. that you are classifying by the column density number, which is tends exactly. to be that 20 yeah. Now the question comes that when I'm thinking about the column density, mm -hmm. is it a uniform kind mm -hmm. of torus or a clumpy torus? To check for that, you are looking at the average NH mm -hmm. and the line of sight NH. Now yes. if they kind of tend to agree with each other, then you kind of conclude yes, that this is at, a at the first order, order approximation. As a first order approximation. The, this is a sort of uniform torus. If it is not, which is most of the cases, mm -hmm. then for sure it is a clumpy torus. That I agree. That I, but whether it's a compound thin or compound thick. That totally depends on the, I mean, historically, it totally depends on the line of sight. 
uh, that's how they uh, classify uh, AGN is function and yeah. proton function. It's a debate. There. Line of sight is nothing wrong. Yes, yes. You don't observe anything else. Okay, so I, I got the confusion. When I'm saying line of sight, I'm saying the one that is coming directly, that is not scattered. When I'm saying average, that is the one that is scattered and reflected and coming, all coming to the line of sight. But one coming directly, another getting scattered and coming to us. So the classification is on the basis of what I'm seeing directly, whether it's a Compton peak or Compton. I get the. How are you? How are you? Uh, you know, extracting the average. The range and the line of from, that's from, from the modeling. From the modeling, from the because, and you said that the average is you are saying that there should be the reflection com yes, scattered yes. component. Yes. But that is not that you don't see in observation. That you extract from what you observe from, from, from the, the model and then put the model. Right. The, then the model extracts that number. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Oh. So for the clumpiness part, we also put. Uh, the Compton T AGN population that we have with new star data. And we find that they are also extensively clumpy and it also like uh, agrees with the one that we find with the CT AGN candidates. So the finally the results we get is that we updated the census of the CT AGN population and we find that the number still comes around 8%. And uh, in the we see that as we we go out with the ratio, <laughs> as we move outwards, the number actually district, uh, decreases drastically. So uh, and it also contradicts with the CXB, CXB population synthesis uh, okay. prediction. Yes. So what we need is wide and deep survey uh, with sensitive X-ray instruments, which we don't have at the same time. That with also the uh, like which is doing wide and also deep simultaneously. If we can have, then probably we can solve this mystery that where are the missing CT AGN? Because we are not getting them. So either they're so faint that we are not getting it anyway, or whether there is a possibility we, we can get them in certain ways. So to explore that possibility, let's see a multi-wave length approach. But you see, this is a, uh, Centura say is a very famous and one of the closest AGM we have. It is has jet actually. But when we observe it in the X-ray band and the infrared band, we see a very different picture. So for a better classic and a better classification, we actually need both approach because the infrared band is coming from the torus and also from the host galaxy and polar dust. So and that is coming as a re-emission from what is uh, uh, is feeding from inside. That is the UV and the X-rays and all these things. So a simultaneous analysis using uh, X-ray spectral X-ray spectra with uh, uniform torus and also clumpy torus models and ACD fitting, we will get a better characterization how much the torus is obscuring. And even if we are missing something, whether there is a uh, we can find uh, uh, these missing uh, CT AGMs. So we started this campaign very recently. And uh, this is the approach we use for the extra spectral analysis. We are taking, select. we have selected some obscured sources, which has multi-epoch. Multi-epoch means they are observed for a long time, not like two, three observations, but for eight, 10, 12, 14 observations. And we have used for these observations as these are multiple time observed and this has been classified as clumpy because this has a very different uh, column densities. We have used clumpy torus model for better characterization. And we checked whether there is a variability of the column density or the flux. And then we use the optical to infrared ACD fitting where we use multi-component ACD. Uh, and we gave the information from the X-ray fit to the ACD and then try to characterize how, what is the torus nature actually. So we have started this campaign very recently and this is one of the sources, 1358, which has a changing look nature. That is, it was Compton thick in uh, 2017, but it became Compton thin around 21, 22. So the column density changes, that is the clouds are moving and the movement of the cloud are uh, giving these kind of values. 
And after observing this in, uh, this was in 22, we uh, sampled out around 30 potentially variable obscure sources from Jao 21. And this is one of the sources where you see a, a, a very strong uh, column density variability with time. Uh, that is the line of set column density changes a lot. So the cloud movements are taking place. And also in many of these sources, we use the US clumping model, which I was showing, which has an inner ring, that the inner block along the equatorial region. Many of this model is consistent. Many of this fit is consistent when you use the inner ring. So there is a potentially very dense inner uh, ring of compton thick gas, which is responsible for the reflection component. No, 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 no. It's, it's, it's not that. It's just in the paradigm of uh, obscuration. Uh, so, yeah, here you can see is it, this one is one of the sources actually where the this line you see is the average column density. Yeah. And the line of sight column density is quite above the average column density. You can see in, in, in this source, particularly 4388. Uh, the one that I will show here is NGC 6000, which I mentioned a bit also in the follow in the conference. So this source has been observed like 10 times, where Newstar has been observed three times, and there are other sources. And this is the extraspectral fit, where collectively we have these information. So the average column density is around 10 to the power 24. And the line of column density is around 10 to the power 23, almost one order less. Uh, and the inclination, uh, but we see that there is a, we are now going to a second order classification. So as we have multi-epoch monitoring, we are also trying to see whether there is a change of column density in all the time. So when we are seeing that there is no change of column density, then we are then classifying in the second order way that it has a homogeneous torus, that is a not homogeneous torus, a homogeneous torus cloud along the line of sight column density. So it is not changing. But we cannot say with confidence that this is a homogeneous cloud or not. And we also find the inclination angle for a factor, but very much interestingly, we also find that there is a thick ring of inner gas, which I showed in this uh, diagram, uh, which is required to fit this data properly. So there is a thick ring of inner gas and then there is, it's coming out uh, as a reflection component. It's giving out the reflection component. If we see it in the variability analysis, we see that this uh, column density doesn't, it, it hardly changes with time, it stays same. Compared to the previous one where you see lots of ups and downs. And these are some uh, statistical thing which I'm not going in detail. And in the flux, we see interestingly that there is a sharp flux drop in 2020 observation. So just keep in mind this source was at a constant column density, but there is a decrease of flux. That can only happen when we are observing the torus from a same cloud, but there is some intrinsic luminosity changes taking place within the accretion disk. That has uh, marked this, uh, that has uh, given the signature of the fall of this uh, flux. So this is very interesting to see what is happening in this. This source was actually classified as a changing loop candidate in early 2000, but it was never, it was saying that they are going through a period of low activity. But it never we have observed with the flux that there is a change of, there's, there is any change of flux. Only in the last observation, we have found that there is a change of flux. So we are looking for the next uh, epoch of observations, either in XMM or Chandra, whether we can see any changes of flux. And also we're trying to tie up with new stars so that we see any change also in the reflection hump on that. Uh, and along with that, uh, these are the all the sources, the 30 sources and we uh, that we have observed. We found that around 37% uh, of the sources shows NH variability, that there is change of column density, and around 44% shows no NH variability. Uh, and the remaining, we, there is no variability at all. And only NGC 6000 is the source that we found that there is flux variability, but no column density variability. And we also did a ACD fitting. That is, we extracted the information from extra, uh, from extra spectral analysis. We put it in Sigale. 
from the photometric points and also the intrins uh, intrinsic flux. And we calculated the AGN disc luminosity, optical depth, and all the other informations that is necessary for the characterization of the torus. And these are, this is the speed that we get. It is in the mid infrared or in the infrared band uh, uh, that you see in the right side. And the left side is the X ray. And uh, we find from, we calculated the volumetric luminosity for this source. And we find that it, the Eddington ratio is coming to be around the range of uh, radiatively inefficient accretion rate, that is RIA. So that is more or less the result that we found from this source. And we cannot get any more uh, information from whatever we have from this source, from the optical and also from the X-rays, that whatever we have. So this paper is submitted and I'm going to summary. So the summary is that I tried to present a comprehensive and systematic analysis of the obscured AGN candidates in the local universe. And I have used uh, the X-ray data, Chandra, XM Newton, Suzaku also, and others for less than 10 kV and new star for above 10 kV. And these uh, torus models to classify. And I have found that it's around coming around 8%, the census of CT AGN, which is far below than the predicted fraction. So I'm not solving any anything in my, this was actually my PhD thesis, but I didn't do anything. <laughs> I just added one extra question mark to the question mark, which is already there. And uh, the, the presence, uh, uh, we find that there are some of this uh, uh, AGN actually had an inner quantum thick ring, which uh, is responsible for the reflection component. So these sources are very interesting to check for further follow-ups. And multi-wavelength ACD is something, a technique that we have used is very well constraining the torus parameters. So in the future work, we will uh, first let's talk uh, the thing that uh, that is the conclusion is that we need high quality and sensitive X-ray data above 10 kb, which at the present we only have new stuff, but in future we will have we'll have some more. And uh, we also need uh, actually is a new CSB population synthesis model. Because the old ones used very uh, uh, phenomenological models to classify whether it's a quantum thick or quantum thick. They didn't take into consideration so much complexities of inner ring or clumpiness or reflection, uh, reflection components. So we need something like that. And also we are continuing to do the torus investigation, the variability study in, with the multi of monitoring. We'll continue to do with some other sources extremely faint sources also. And also we'll continue the multi-wavelength ACD fitting and try to see for those sources where there is very weak X-rays, but comparatively better optical and infrared data and try to fit and uh, get a better characterization of the obscuring numbers. So on that note, uh, I end my talk. Uh, I will take questions. Do I have so many cats here? It's the uncertainty. Oh. <laughs> okay, questions? I have. Is this? Yeah, it's not a general question, but my question is how does obscured AGNs and their different types affect the galaxy evolution of the whole galaxy? Yes, I mean, the the reason is, is how the obscured AGNs formed, or in general, how AGNs formed. The formation of an AGN is still a mystery, but generally there are lots of models. There are some models which says that it forms in a, it's it's a standalone uh, way, that there's a feedback and the AGN form and then it again deactivates and again forms. There are also other uh, theories that AGN can form when two galaxy merges mm -hmm. and then it kick the activity and then uh, the AGN eventually will, uh, will stay for a certain time. So this obscuration can, for these two cases, this obscuration can arise in two different ways. For one case, there, when the galaxy merges, the obscuration, the gas will surround everything and will uh, cover everything so in that. In the standalone way, if there is a single activity, then probably there is a feed, feeding of gas. The, it gets uh, highly energized. And then after a certain time when the feeding decreases, the energy decreases and then again the gas starts forming because it's pushing out all the other gases. So it's getting it's, it gives us it gives us an understanding how 
with different uh, redshift and how these different processes are affecting this uh, evolution of galaxy and what is affecting the galaxy. So the, the paradigm which helps is to, in a way, to understand and classify that uh, what are the nature of the evolution or, or and also how the uh, evolution might go in future. So this is a very broader picture. Yeah, but there is a distinct difference between an unobscured region and an obscured region when it comes to galaxy evolution. This is distinct. In, 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 in certain cases, yes. I mean, generally, uh, yes. I mean, if there is a merger paradigm, generally it's not very obscure. It's unobscured. So I just can I just add a comment to this question? So the so the, the other idea is that is it that obscuration is just a phase of the day? Yeah. An obscure can transfer to an unobscured one. Yes. So so in a sense that uh, how it affects the galaxy evolution so far. It is unclear that if there is, uh, if it's a phase of an AGM, then, you know, it comes as an unified picture. Yeah. So, yes. Thank you. Very much, uh, Yes. Uh, so, when you're studying, doing a CL model, uh, mm -hmm. so CL probably just the start for to the start point. Yes. So, I mean, when you're doing extra analysis, you are twice for choices. I mean, you have so many models. Hmm. So we have limitations. Yes, but uh, when you are doing uh, using CL, so you are uh, limited by whatever is present. <laughs> yeah. So how does that work? I mean, if they are, they are two different, and what I'm trying to say is that, let's say the Scott would have some models, and your extra analysis says that that model is not preferred. Let's say something else is preferred. Hmm. So, but uh, I mean, then how do you manage? The thing is, Scott code assumes that every torus has both smooth and clumpy nature. So, uh, every torus has a smooth distribution of gas clouds with different clumps. So, uh, so it has made also very flexibly. So, we can use it in such a way. So, generally, we prefer to use because there is not a single torus ideally that is absolutely smooth or absolutely clumpy. So we have to play a bit on that. So on the basis of that, there are some open questions and uncertainties, but the characterization that I would prefer to trust more is coming from the X-rays because it's very more direct. And then we'll try to see how much the SCAR code is doing because that's, as you said, that's all we have at the moment. We just have to trust uh, that process. It has open question because of the it has both the nature. Other question? Yeah, uh, so yeah, I think it's related to uh, uh, Origit's question. So can you go to the place where you are doing the uh, host galaxy modeling part also, right? I mean, so you no, you would not doing host galaxy modeling. I I, I mean uh, in in a in a oh, yes yes I, I had to do I had to do some very trivial. Uh, Values. Let me, let me go there because I, I thought that there were IR and etc. I mean, Seagal is essentially a I, I, Here, I didn't show I know that. that. Okay. GN is yes. just an additional. Yes, yes. So, I no, thought so, so, the so, dominant so. component in IR is the Tora, not yeah. the. Uh, yes, 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 from yes. Well, uh, I mean, it has actually. There, is also, both. there, there are both. Yeah, hmm. There are both. So, I was thinking that. Do you actually have infrared counterparts of your sources or or do you use infrared data anywhere in this modeling? Yeah, yes, sir. Yes, so 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 you have infrared and what what else optical? Is it wise? Yes, but infrared. Is it, it, yeah, has, so, it has wise. I can show we have uh, done the this one. So it has like uh, wise, uh, spire, two mass, and we have. So you also had like uh, targeted observations, yes. or you took archive? No, no, we took archive. You took archive, archive. also, yes. So you have, uh, you know, uh, counterparts in IR, and also you have optical. Is that right? Yes, yes. yes. So and then you are doing the seagull fitting, seagull. and as uh, uh, what is it is saying that if you do the seagull fitting, mm -hmm. that would also give you parameters of the scatter model. Yes, right? yes, exactly. And that, that you can actually can... compare with the X-ray spectra can... exactly. thing, which, which shows that how much reliable is this. It's, I mean, I mean it's true. Exactly, that. It, that is what my work is, that to use the X-ray 
to build the stuff to have the results and also then compare whether it's uh, so that helps then you have but more instruction go to yeah. yes jointly fitting because only but basically in extra, there is only two points so two flux points so that is the only thing it's really. and also the power law also no, but that's you how the figure is here. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I mean, in it's a figure, you just do like photometric. I mean, yes, yes, you just put in photometric. You can put more points. Put in, it 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 in that range, you put 15 more points, is not going to help much in your. Yes, yes. Any other question? Yes, back to my third question. That uh, that uh, that background, Excel background. Mm. We were saying again, forty percent of uh, to contributed by uh, obscure effects. Mm. I think you are getting that number. Yes, to me. So yes. I know about uh, EDL, that uh, optical background one. Why do you have that uh, thing contributed by galaxy, contributed by different things, which are related to observation? Observation is how much you get it. Okay. Then you add some component to say that, no, these are the missing things, something like that. So here is exactly how you are fitting. I mean, you say it's contributed 40% by agent, that means 40% has been already observed. I mean, it's a mix. I mean, the I mean, these uh, numbers that you see is coming from Gilly and Ananda. Both are synthesis model papers. And how they made this, they did some, there was already some observations. And on the basis of some observations, they calculated some extra luminosity function. And then on the basis of that, they uh, created this model and found this number. So they assume yeah. all contributions coming from 40% coming from Content from content, content assumption, yes. Assumption. Yeah, that's, yes. that's not of the. No, 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 it's, no, no, this, exactly this what is not. So, what yes. my question is if we have the observed number density of AGM, yes. hmm. how much you are going to fit to this extra background? That is quite low, as we see. That's what the problem is. That, that is the problem. That the population, so you have a measurement of the CHD. And the population synthesis model claims that this CXD has to come, 40% of the CXD has to come from Compton's No, KGS. that also may not be true because I don't know all the total AGM. No, no, that's, that's the question that let's say in the pop pop, this is a modeling, theoretical yes. modeling. So they he or others are trying to answer mm -hmm. that if 40% has to come from the Compton thick AGM, then we have to find those Compton thick I understand that. Which we don't but, know. But I, I want to know that is, one is the trivia. Yes. That yes. I want to know. Is is there how much is this number density of total AGM and obscure fraction? How much is actually I can go to this? That, that, that we can, we haven't done. But we can check. Because so this is the observed part. Because in this, in this, uh, whatever it's it is, this missing is the, obscured AGM. It is just a missing uh, obscured AGM. So what our, uh, SSL is saying with this fraction yeah. or whatever fraction we have, if we model try to model CXB. the CXB, how does it look? We yeah. haven't done it, it but we could. Uh, we, we can because try. that's what I want to know. That I have yes. AGM as well as you include some fraction of it which has been observed. So you can't explain the CSB with this observed uh, compulsive yes. fraction. If you look at all the yes. AGM and how much extra they can emit, okay. and if you try to model the CSB, it will be lower. You cannot explain but that. that yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's is it only missing? Missing, missing, missing AGM. The obscure region or also something? You're missing other region it, too. It's either missing or there is some problem with the CSB population synthesis model. Either of the two. No. So. No, I think there are other questions that yeah. in the synthesis model, the problem could be that that 40% number, it could yes. be lower than that, etc. I mean, it, but the fact that the CSB exists and it has to be explained is not, is not, is a, is a unchallenged. That's a real problem. Correct. And other than ADN, Unless there are exotic sources oh, in the oh, universe, we don't know I, what I, can cause the. That's why I am interested. What is that? Cosmic interesting with uh, particles and things like that, uh, producing gamma rays and maybe. Uh, 
So one has to look at CXB papers. But I had predicted that was much lower compared to the Gamma Ray But I don't know about it. But okay. yeah, from what I hear from the CSB people, that if they are very confident that it has to come from Indian, other things can't be. Yeah, be right that's what I but uh, but do you think that there, there is a significant population of that of can English. kick this? Uh, I don't know. I don't. So that's why I am interested in it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Any other question? No, just the one is just asking mm -hmm. that why it is going background with diffused X ray that is background. Uh, oh, it is oh, point yeah. source removes. <laughs> just like this. Remove the point source. All yes. the backgrounds are defined like that. So the cosmic oh, yes. microwave background, you if you look everywhere, you all get the, the similar things. So this is also like that. Diffuse, that's it's like it's primordial, but there is no primordial. No, 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 yeah. the background has nothing to do with Big Bang. It is yeah. just that it's the diffuse from here. Since all the even higher redshifts are also included, and those are the particularly the ones that we are not being able to resolve and that is creating this sort of smooth background, that's why it is called background. Or everything. It's also coming from very high redshifts. There is infrared background, there is gravitational wave background. Yeah. <laughs> Neutrino background. Neutrino background. That is primordial. Neutrino background is primordial. Okay, if there are no other questions, let's thank the speaker again. And Shini, do you want to announce? Yeah, so there is a program in Dirozio Hall uh, regarding uh, justice for... So it's like a... Yeah. Social uh, sort of uh, people from various yeah, social backgrounds, both from medical, right. from uh, academia, from uh, you know, uh, workers, uh, uh, working groups. So there are lots of different groups of people that are coming together, and there will be some discussions, there will be some.